Good morning everyone. On behalf of Armagh City, Bombridge and Craig Edinburgh Council, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this morning's webinar. Available grants for business and how to win them. This webinar is part of the mentoring support to local businesses applying for grant funding. This programme aims to provide businesses and entrepreneurs with the knowledge and skills needed to identify successfully and apply for grant assistance. Today we will hear from Claire McGee and Barney Toll from Innovate NI about using a 12-step guide on how to write a winning grant application and information on grants and streams of funding that are currently open. Wishing you every success. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, for the welcome and introduction, and good morning, everyone. We're delighted to see such a good turnout for today's webinar. My name is Claire McGee, and along with Barney Toll, who you'll hear from shortly, we are the co-founders of Innovate NI. We deliver, currently, um, the Transform Your Business programme and this grant application support programme for Armagh City, Bambridge and Craig Avon Council. Today's agenda is quite intense, as you can see. There's a lot to cover, but don't worry about missing something or taking lots of notes, as the webinar is being recorded and a copy of the presentation will also be made available to all participants. So throughout the session, please use the Q&A facility to submit any questions and we'll cover those off at the end. Um, so now, just to highlight what open grants are available and to take you through the 12-step guide to apply for them, I'll pass you over to my co-founder, Barney Toll. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Claire. I hope uh, everybody can see me. Um, delighted that there's such a great turnout today. So what I'm going to do is share my screen for the next 40 minutes or so uh, and allow you to benefit from our experiences in securing and delivering or and securing and finding over the moon. Can you see my screen here? Yeah, Barney, we can see your screen. And yeah, I can't. It's just kind of annoying. Um, oh, there we are. Apologies for that. Um, as Claire said, we, we deliver both the um, Transform Your Business program and this one, the Grant Application Support program for ABC. Now, over the last 20 years, um, basically the business we run runs through developing and supporting programs for businesses like yourselves. And we do that through applying for grants and applying for tenders. And since 2001, we have secured uh, somewhere around 11 to 12 million pounds worth of grants and tenders. So today, I'd like to share some of our experiences with you and our processes and how we kind of tend to shorten the odds. We're not successful every time, obviously, in what we do, but shorten the odds in terms of how we uh, go about um, making applications for, for grants. So this program is quite simple uh, and it's there because applying for a grant can seem very daunting, a uh, very daunting task to many small business owners. Where to discover about grants, what information you need about the grant and about your business, and in particular, how to write a successful application. So thankfully, ABC has recognized these issues and established the grant application support program to provide you with an independent advisor to advise on how to improve your winning percentages as you write your grant application. The eligibility criteria are straightforward as you can see and if you're a novice grant applicant or have previously been unsuccessful in grant applications then we particularly welcome uh, you onto the course. We have a rolling up registration on a first come first serve basis with up to 50 places remaining on the program. So as you can see from the online expression of interest form, uh, it should take you no more than five minutes to complete. Basically, what are the areas of grant support you're interested in? What grant are you currently in the process of applying for? And then just details on your business, contact name, uh, the type of business, what sector you work in. So if you want to get on the program, if you're applying for a grant and you feel that you would like some support, then please register your interest. So where do we find grants? Well, 
there are literally thousands of grants available across the UK for small businesses, for large businesses, social enterprises and charities. So it's not surprising that finding your way through this maze uh, can be time consuming. We find it frustrating as well, and it can be a headache, but luckily there are shortcuts. Uh, you can see on the screen there, uh, a list of subscription services available, such as Grant Finder or Grants Online. And they have databases of all grants that can be easily searched, albeit for a price. Other sources include government ones like government.gov.uk for general grants for businesses. In fact, that's where all the COVID-19 grants uh, were initially promoted, as well as the innovation grants, uh, which are distributed by Innovate UK, which is a government organization. But for Northern Ireland specific grants, probably the best and the, the free source of information is nibusinessinfo.co.uk. So if we just click onto that for a minute, uh, you can see that it's a straightforward website. And today there are 197 grants available in Northern Ireland. Now, 197 grants is, a, is an awful lot you know, to think of going through, but very simple process to use here. You can use your business need to identify what particular area you want in, and you can filter through uh, many of the the uh, items that are along the left hand side to narrow your search. So let's take an example of sales and marketing. So if you're looking for a sales and marketing grant or support, there's 45 schemes available. If we look at uh, the business sector, and we quite often get a lot of retail, they do a lot of sales and marketing, we find there are 37 schemes available. If we go down to look at the type of support, we look for grant support, and we see there's eight schemes available. And if we look at the council area for Armagh, Banbridge and City, we see there are still eight. So those eight programmes are probably available right across Northern Ireland. And there are things like digital selling capability uh, to allow you to move your business from uh, bricks into clicks. Uh, there are lots of other things in there like a, a EU exit or Brexit, as you're probably more aware of, business support grant. So if we decide we, we're not interested just in grants, but let's look for expertise and advice. Then you find that it's expanded to 15 programs and ones which are specific to the ABC council area. There's a Win More Business, which is a tendering program. There's a digital retail therapy program, which is allows you to do a diagnostic of your business for digital. And then if you move down to the bottom, you'll see Transform Your Business, which is the other business uh, support program that we run. So that is a very, very useful tool. Um, another useful tool is to subscribe to your council, local council newsletter. Uh, again, it's very, very simple to do. You subscribe to the mailing list. You can, all these uh, links will be sent to you after the, the presentation, by the way. So to subscribe to the mailing list, it's very simple. Give us your, your uh, email address and your business details. And the council will then put you on their mailing list. And they have a, have a process of updating all the most common grants, the most recent grants that come on stream. So it will really help you to uh, identify uh, new particular grants. So as we've seen that there, there are 197 grants available, I'm not gonna to spend today going through them all because it would obviously bore you, but here's an example of some of them. And um, these range from the first one, which we saw already, the, the Digital Selling Capability Grant. Uh, for Northern Ireland only. Uh, for those of you who want to take part in that, uh, the deadline is Friday. So going against everything I'm going to talk about later, you're possibly leaving it a little bit late. But there's a lot of grants also for proof of concept, for product development, for uh, putting in management information systems. And some are only open to Invest NI clients and some are open to everybody. But as you can see, it's very easy to access through uh, nibusinessinfo.co.uk. And it's certainly something that you should have you know, at hand you know, at least you know, every week. Just take a quick look through it and see what's available out there. So what I'd like to do now is seeing that grants are available is one thing, but we really want to make sure that we can shorten our odds on getting successful grant applications. So I'd like to take you through our experience in writing many, many grant applications. Uh, we're not successful in the wall by any means, and I can't guarantee you success, but I can certainly increase your percentage success rate. 
So too many people, when they hear of a grant being made available, focus on the outcome. They focus on what would I do with all that money that's sitting at the top of those 12 steps? My idea is fabulous, so why wouldn't it get funded? And many more fail to get funding and actually get it. So uh, obviously it's not just going to be handed to you, no matter how great you think your, your project is. So what I have done is I've broken down that application process into 12 steps. And while it's always good to keep your eye on that goal at the end, it's also very important to focus on each of those 12 steps. So your grant application is the story of your business and to all intents and purposes. So you need to tell a good story. But before a good story starts, there's always the prologue to place that story in context. So before you put your foot on that first step, consider all the various contexts around which you will write your story. You see the grant is focused on you, but you also need to think of the funder. What do they want? Read their terms of reference, read their aims and objectives. What's their focus? Is it employment? Is it export? Is it new product development? Is it digital technology adoption? Will your proposal deliver against their objectives? So you need to make an early what we call a go or no decision. So is this grant right for you? Is your project a right fit for the grant? If you can't fulfill the funder's objectives, then reconsider making your application. If you don't meet their eligibility criteria, and we recently had a, had a rural, DERA had a rural business development grant. So maybe you need to be a rural business and you're not. Maybe you need to have a minimum of a million pound turnover and you don't. So reconsider your application. If it's a 50% grant fund with a minimum spend of 10,000 pounds, do you have 5,000 pounds to match fund? If not, reconsider your application. Grant calls, bear in mind, are always oversubscribed and there'll be many who meet the eligibility requirements fully. So if you think your eligibility is a gray area, then either don't apply or contact the funders for clarification before you spend valuable time writing your proposal. The next thing I always put my head on because I've also been on the other side of the, the table being an assessor, think of the assessor. He or she may have to wade through dozens of applications. So make it easy for them. Keep your response short and concise. Show a passion for your business in your story. Make them want to support you. And remember, quite probably, different sections in your application form will have different scoring weightings. So these are normally highlighted uh, in the terms of reference. So don't write a loads of response to a question that's worth 10 marks, because that's an easy one and you like it, and gloss over one that's worth 50 marks. Remember, make it easy for them to see how your proposal meets their objectives. Spell it out for them. Be really pedantic if you have to be, but clearly show how your application meets what they're looking for. So define your needs. Step one, you know, many people fall into the trap of seeing a grant opportunity and try to shoehorn their business into that grant. Grant funders and assessors are adept at fishing out these chancers. Remember, there used to be many more grants available to businesses than there are now. So now, demand is high and always far exceeding the supply. So more applicants are going to chance their arm if they think there's easy money. A recent grant fund opened the one for the retail sector we pointed out earlier. And I got a query from a business and you know, straightforward said, you know, there's a grant available. What should I apply for? Well, I don't know the ins and outs of his business. I don't know the needs that would be met by the grant, but he should. And if you cannot describe a clear need that can be met by the grant, then don't apply for the grant. And remember, grants have very specific aims and objectives which must be met by the applicant. So have a very clearly defined need, which can be quantified. What's your business goals? Are they not being met? Is there an opportunity that for your business that can be fulfilled by the project? Will the project help your business grow sustain or increase employment or open up new products, services, and markets. So if there is a gap in your business model, whether that's a product, a service, or a process, you must be able to identify what impact that is having on your business and how it's hindering you from attaining these goals. Is it causing higher costs, higher overheads, reducing your customer potential, or lowering your profitability? 
if you can quantify these, then that is brilliant. So there's a major difference between need and want. Grants are there to fulfill needs, not to satisfy your wants. Step two, identify a suitable grant. The opportunity is there are loads of grants and support programs available out there. The problem is there are loads of grants and support programs available out there. So finding a suitable grant for your business need can be a time consuming process, never mind the time required to complete a successful application. But we have seen how this can be short circuited through the likes of NI Business Info. And remember that not all grants are cash based. Knowledge acquisition, learning, coaching and training are all forms of support which are exceedingly beneficial to you and your business, maybe even more so than cash. And as we saw whenever we went on to NI Business Info, there were eight grant based uh, um, subjects, but there were 15 uh, support knowledge based ones. So there's generally a lot more out there that are program based. So identifying a suitable grant or support that meets a quantifiable need within your business and you're halfway there. The other thing to really look at is each grant has its own set of eligibility criteria which must be met before you even move on to how well your proposal will score in terms of how you'll meet the aims, objectives and impacts of the grant itself. Make sure that you read and meet those eligibility criteria before beginning any application process. As I said previously, the demand for grants far outstrips supply of funds and assessor, the assessor's role is to apply criteria rigorously to every application. Their job is to cut it down by maybe 90% to get the 10% of the applicants who will actually get funded. So if your business has to have been trading for at least two years, be able to demonstrate that it has. Show your, your registration, show when the company was formed. Uh, if you must have a minimum, minimum number of employees, likewise, if you have contracts of employment, then keep those. So if somebody asks, demonstrate that you have got 12 employees, it's there. You must pass all of the eligibility criteria to prevent your application being dismissed at that very important first hurdle. The next thing is, do the grant objectives meet your needs? If it's a capital only grant, then you can't put revenue or running costs in your proposal. But you might be asked how you intend to run the equipment. Where are you gonna come up with the money? to run the piece of equipment that you're going to get the grant for. If it's a staff training grant, you cannot include costs for laptops and you will be asked how you intend to make such equipment available. And overhead or management costs are generally excluded from grant applications. So you've identified a need and found a suitable grant. You can begin to complete the application form. Now each form and each grant is very different and the amount of information right, will be required by the funder will obviously vary depending upon the amounts of funding available. If you're applying for a £5,000 grant or a £500,000 grant, then obviously the amount of information that you have to provide uh, is going to be vastly different. So a recent grant, which is on a rolling basis, but this one actually closed um, in uh, the end of July. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, is for a small capital grant for uh, agricultural, for rural based companies. And again, you know, a lot of the information available is quite simple. Uh, your name, contact details, what you do, their sectors that your business operates in, they are employment, full time, part time, sales turnover. Um, and then simply going through and looking at describe your project, describe the need, describe the outcomes. Uh, describe your management strength. So that is very often repeated again and again in all project applications. So really, it's important that uh, we can take a generic look at how we fill in that type of application form. Uh, and we're going to use a case study as we go through this. I've changed the name of the company, but the details are more or less uh, as we're in an, in an application which we work with them on. One of the things that you need to be able to say to somebody, and it's it's sometimes called the elevator pitch, you know, describe your business. What does it do? 
what does it want to do? So this is an exercise that we believe can be prepared in advance and it's probably a useful exercise to do anyway. So for any proposal, whether it's a grant, whether it's a tender or whether it's a loan, you'll need to provide basic overview of your business, name, address, legal status, when it was established, what sector it operates in, all, all those type of activities. Um, you'll be asked about the number of employees, uh, sales turnover. So always have those things to mind. And you'll be asked to include uh, an overview of your business activities, what products and services are offered. And it's amazing whenever we talk to businesses and say, well, tell me about your product range, your service range. And they'll pick one or two which come to mind, but there are probably a lot more than that. Types of customers, vitally important to understand, you know, who are your customers? What's their profile? What, what, what do they buy? What do they buy more of? What do they buy less of? Method of sale, you know, are you retail? Are you wholesale? Do you sell online? Uh, and any export activities. Now, I'm saying all this because it's really important to have a picture of your business in your head because you've also got to assume that the person who's reading your application has got no knowledge of your business or your sector. So you must explain your business clearly and concisely and try to avoid using acronyms. We'll come on to that a little bit later. But it's always worthwhile just doing this, take a half hour exercise to yourself, you know, and look at what this, what is the snapshot of your business. Um, and people often ask me, what about, you know, what sector are we operating in? Well, there are things called um, sectoral, sectoral industrial classification codes, standard industrial classification codes. So you can go on to uh, sickcode.com and you can look at manufacturing and you'll get a number which is against your type of manufacturing. So let's say you're manufacturing in industrial and commercial machinery and it keeps breaking down and breaking down. So we're internal combustion engines. So there's your classification code, um, 3519. So some, some uh, grant funders ask for your SIC code, others just ask for it uh, by descriptive of the, the sector that you're in. But bear in mind, again, I'm gonna come back to this again and again, assume whoever's reading this has zero knowledge of your business. Another way of really getting to the point is try to develop a one sentence uh, description of your business. And I mentioned earlier the, the elevator pitch. And if you're at business schools, whatever, they always say, what's your elevator pitch? How can you tell me in one sentence what your business is? And basically, if you answer five questions, you can do that. Uh, if you have a grant application form, which is very low on space, on word count, then this is a great way to introduce your business. What's the name? What do you sell? Who do you sell it to? What problem do you help them solve or goal to help them achieve? And what makes you different? And in the case study that we, we talked about, uh, we had, I had a very great solution. The company's name isn't Cuttech, um, but their description was, we provide high quality wood, metal and plastic fabrication services to small engineering manufacturing craft companies on a 24 seven basis, which allows them to bring new products to the market quickly and at a competitive cost. So we've got business name, what do we sell? High quality wood, metal, and plastic fabrication services to, who do we sell it to? Small engineering, manufacturing craft companies. What problems do they help them solve? They can bring new products to the market quickly at a competitive cost. What makes them different? They have a 24 seven uh, accessibility. Brilliant. One sentence business statement. We saw in the application form that you generally give your project a, a meaningful title. So again, I thought this one was a lovely one. It's a company, they're looking uh, to get into laser cutting equipment. So making light work uh, is a lovely pun on what it is that they were doing. So in your project description, bear in mind that your assessor is probably going to be reading several dozen applications. And I mentioned this before, keep the assessor happy. So keep your project description short and to the point. So he and she, he or she can quickly ascertain that your project does indeed fit within the broad parameters for eligibility. In this case, the grant will fund capital purchases in rural businesses to improve the business. So I mentioned earlier, there's a difference between need and want. It's important to demonstrate need in relation to your project. There's no point in you just saying that you say, I need this. You need to take a step back 
from your viewpoint of succeeding in getting that grant and look at it from the perspective of the funders. In effect, a funder is an investor with an investment fund and their own key performance indicators. So they're looking to invest in your business. So if someone came to you and asked for £10,000 of your own money to invest in their idea, as well as examining their track record in business, you would first of all want to establish the need for the product. And the more hard quantifiable information you can receive, the more you may be inclined to part with your hard-earned cash. Well, it's exactly the same for funders. They haven't been magically given funds to disperse, but have probably had to develop a business case, generally a case to a government department, set their aims and objectives, promise key performance indicators, and ensure that the funds that they are uh, creating, are, that, they're, that the funds are creating a return on investment that has been entrusted to them. So to satisfy them and your proposal, you need to have carried out a lot of research to demonstrate need, and particularly if you can provide quantification of that need, because you know what, you can be sure your fellow applicants will be doing exactly that. So I'm not necessarily going to read this, but this statement from Cuttech shows that they have looked at both the demand from the customer, they've gone out the questionnaires, and the supply by researching the competitor's side of their business, and provided quantification of that research, uh, and tied that into the need for competitiveness and business sustainability. As I said, I don't expect you to read all this now in your own time. Uh, you'll, you'll be sent a copy of the presentation, you can study it in your own time. But you can see from there, you know, they've put in percentages, they have got uh, quantification, and that always stands to good stead whenever you are uh, putting forward your, uh, your um, project need. The project impact obviously follows on from the project need. And again, I would suggest that you consider the funders as your investors. While they may not want a cash return on their investment, they do have other key impact parameters. And these may be to increase employment. Uh, they may be to encourage business growth, to develop new products and services, or sustain existing income levels, or to generate additional income through new products, new services, or new markets. So how would your project contribute to these? So again, look, do a bit of background work, look at what the funders, what their aims and objectives are, and show as many as possible, as much as possible, how your project impact will add to their objectives. What you're trying to do is to say to them, you invest in me, you will get the money. So again, I'm not going to expect to, to read through all this, but uh, there are certain quantifications, again, where possible, quantify the impact on your business over the coming 12 months. Note that Cuttech have confirmed their financial projections and have been working with an accountant. It always does no harm to, harm to name of the firm. Uh, it shows that you have a willingness to seek external assistance to grow your business. And here, the grant objectives include increasing revenues, which was shown, creating employment, which was shown, and developing new business opportunities. I suggested in steps six and seven that funders could be considered as investors in your business, and consequently, they'll be looking upon your business with quite a discerning eye. Now, we've been working with uh, investors for, for quite a long time. Uh, in our day-to-day -day job. And while investors do consider need and impact as important attributes, their main focus lies with the person. Investors invest in people, not ideas or businesses. They won't invest in somebody that they see will take their investment, apply it to their idea, apply it to their business, and achieve their targets and goals. So it's very important that you can put forward a good picture of yourself. They'll want to hear about you, how you got to where you are, what knowledge you bring to the business, how you run your business, how you manage your staff, how you keep up to date in your sector, how you open your new ideas, learnings, etc. So really, it's the all-round management strength, the all-round capability and ability of you is what they're going to what they're going to fund. So you want to really paint as positive and as upbeat picture of yourself. Obviously not without lying, because that's the type of person that you are. You are positive, you are upbeat, and you are a great manager. So 
So be clear and concise and positive. Again, here is the uh, management strength response uh, from Cuttech. It's very clear. The person is an engineer. She's female, the only one in her class. She showed drive and ambition by working in metal fab business for six years, saw that she could do better, recognized opportunity, provide a higher quality service, went out there, uh, employed good quality staff, and encouraged staff improvement by sending them on refresher courses. The business has grown to a half million pound turnover in four years, profitable from day one. So obviously uh, the business management side is good, but also demonstrating that they're open, she's open to learning. She's member of lots of networks uh, when she started the business, went on the Gopher program and is actually currently on the ABC Transform Your Business program, getting business mentoring on different aspects of her business. So that gives a very clear cut and very easy to read without much waffle uh, of the management strength of the, the lead person. So depending on the size or complexity, or excuse me, of the grant that you're uh, seeking, you'll be asked for different levels of financial backup, financial information. And that can be as little as give us a, a short financial forecast to let's have a full business plan. Now, obviously, if you're applying for a £5,000 or £10,000 grant, you're not going to be asked to produce a full business plan. Uh, if you're applying for a £500,000 grant, and this is a significant development for your business, then yes, you will. You may also be asked uh, to supply your most recent accounts as submitted, as submitted to HMRC. And that's really to show that you, know, you are a going concern, you have a positive liquidity, you're not just about to go under. You should ensure that your business plan is uh, up to date and not a plan that you've done say five years ago for the Gopher program or for applying for that bank overdraft facility. An up-to-date plan shows that you're taking strategic interest in the growth of your business and that you've adapted to many of the ebbs and flows of business environment. And we all know that there's been loads of those over the last two years and that you are managing your business through those ups and downs. Now, we don't expect you necessarily to, to develop your own business plan, but your accountant or enterprise agency business advisor should be able to help you to develop and or update your business plan. But bear in mind, it's your plan, it's your business. You understand your business better than anyone else. And you need to be at the center of developing that plan. And remember, it can take time to gather together all the necessary information for a proper, robust business plan. So don't leave it to the last minute if there's an application closing date looming. There, you can break down the business plan into 10 essential components. Um, you can look at bits of those that you can do yourself. Um, and bits of those where you need to bring in some assistance or some help, either from your accountant or from uh, um, your advisor. So similarly, if you're just doing financial pro projections, they should be based both on past performance, realistic costs and overheads, and some in-depth market research to justify those projections. Again, if you can quantify the inputs, then the outputs will stand up to whatever uh, rigorous assessment is is going to have. So the more quantifiable backup information you can bring uh, regarding potential market growth, for instance, the more acceptable your projections will appear to the assessor. Now, each specific grant will have its own procurement process. If you're going for a capital grant, uh, they will be detailed in the guidance notes. But generally, you will see um, costs uh, like these, where if the services are good under £5,000, you need to two written quotes. And it's interesting, the DERA uh, capital grant for rural businesses, you could have a grant for up to £4,999. And that's why, so that you only had to get two quotes. If it was above that, then you would have had to get three quotes. So it's basically, that level was set to make life easier for you. Any purchases must have a written specification to go with them. And you must get written quotes from different suppliers, uh, as, as we noted. And you must compare like for like. Generally, you'll be unable to specify a particular brand. You might prefer a Dell laptop over a Hewlett Packard one, but you must take the product which provides the best value for money so you can't really stipulate 
that I want to have a particular brand of, of computer or any other product for that matter. We also need to create a specification, a written specification for each piece of equipment or even for a third party supplier to provide you with a service, you need a specification for that. And that needs to be supplied, that needs to be given to your suppliers uh, and then you must show the correspondence you carried out with your suppliers and their response to show that they got that specification and they, their response, their bill, their quotation their, was based around the specifications of that. And that will be used to ensure that you have met with the requirements of the grant. You must always choose the cheapest product which meets the specification. Uh, again, even if it's not necessarily a brand that, that you want, if it meets the specification, then you're obliged to take it. If you're VAT registered, you can generally request the funding net of VAT. Uh, you must check the grant support and the limits, for example, 50% grant between 500 and up to 4999, uh, for example. So if your piece of equipment in the Vera grant was £12,000, you can only claim £4,099. So that's why it says the grant rate might be up to back 50%. You'll also be asked to provide details of match funding. And um, we had a, a, a recent uh, person who had been talking to me about a, a grant application. And they asked, I asked them, you know, have you got the £4,000 necessary to match fund the grant. And she said, but no, I, I don't. And I don't want to get a loan to do it. So she withdrew from her application before she'd spent too much time. We talked a lot about capital grants, but revenue grants, uh, while they're often in more community groups and not-for-profit organizations who are seeking contributions towards events or activities, for standard businesses, there are staffing grants uh, which cover staff costs. Um, so again, you must provide backup to support any costs which you're seeking grant aid. Uh, and again, you know, if you're running uh, an event as a business or an activity with a third party providers, which is grant supported, you must again get quotes from different providers as specified in the previous uh, grant guidance notes. So step 11. Well done, but remember the prologue. We, we want to try to get as much as we can inside the head of the assessor. So they're sitting, given that they might be oversubscribed, they're sitting reading uh, 25, 35, 40 grant applications. And if somebody has been very long winded, uh, they're just going to be going, oh my Lord, I just want to get to the end of this. So make it easy for the assessor to read your proposal. Nowadays, most grant applications have got word count limits on them. So if you go beyond a 500 word count on your grant, on your grant application, then uh, they'll just simply not read the rest of it. And quite often I've seen people who have put in a lot of introductory waffle in the beginning of a response to a section and all the important bit is at the end. It's beyond the 500 word limit. So basically it's not looked at. Uh, so remember word counts are limits. They're not targets. So be concise, keep your uh, assessor in a good mood. Let them easily see your important and relevant points. So help them to do their job. Um, I came across this uh, uh, on a, uh, on a, as a lesson about how to be concise. If you consider a road sign, no person shall on a Friday, Saturday or Sunday, the day preceding a public holiday or on a public holiday drive or cause to be driven between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. a motor vehicle that exceeds 10.5 meters in length in all main roads. So you would never put that on a road sign. Exactly the same message says no trucks after 6 p.m. on weekends and holidays. So try and, and Cut down on the number of words that you use. Try and say things very concisely. Try and not be overly flowery in, in your approach uh, to, to writing. Uh, as Pearl Homer says, blah, 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 blah. So the second thing is be clear. A lot of grant applications now are online only, which is great, um, but they have the difficulty in that sometimes it's hard to 
uh, not completed all in one go. I've done grant applications which were online where I thought I had saved the work that I'd done, uh, only to come back to find that I had misread the instructions on what to do if you were uh, not completing the application in one go and lost everything that I did. So read the online application form and note down the questions. Create a Word document and answer the question in the Word document. So this will allow you to make changes and additions to edit whenever you are getting near the word or even character count. And don't forget, sometimes we've got character counts in there and characters include spaces uh, and returns. So if you hit return to go to a new line, that's counted as a character. So it can be quite difficult to edit or re-edit your, your work whenever it's online. But if you're doing it in a Word document, it means that you can be think uh, and be concise in your responses, uh, allows you time to write down the, the, the brain dump uh, and then quickly then go back over it and think carefully of what you want to say and how you say it. So you can use the word count function in Word as well to ensure you're keeping within the limits. You must also check your spelling. I know Claire always sort of calls me the, the spelling and grammar Nazi, but for me, it's really important that spelling is, is, is carried out properly. Um, it just gives a much better impression to your assessor if they're not looking at bad spelling and bad grammar, bad punctuation. And if you are using Word or, or a word processor, ensure your default language is, is English UK and not English US, because as we all know, uh, we're two, two people separated by common language. Grammar and punctuation are also important uh, in ensuring that the correct message is quickly conveyed to the assessor. Not only does, does punctuation help you read through the, uh, the document much more uh, easily, commas meaning that there are uh, pauses or uh, the end of one meaning and the beginning of another in the sentence, uh, but they also make sure that the correct message is quickly conveyed to the assessor. So this is a very famous one where uh, a line without any punctuation, a woman without her man is nothing. Uh, that actually can be two things. So a woman without her man is nothing. And that's the opposite of a woman, colon, without her man is nothing. Those are exact opposites of meaning. And yet in the first one, without the punctuation, you wouldn't necessarily know what the, the meaning was. So now both are clear and easily understood. So again, just think of think of punctuation. You may mislead unintentionally the assessor who takes a different meaning out of what it is that you're trying to say. Again, check your text size and font. These are often stipulated. So to ensure that you don't use Arial Narrow Font 8 to cram in as many words as possible if you're giving an A4 page limit rather than a word count. And if you have different authors, ensure uniformity across uh, the document. Uh, I once got rejected from a grant proposal because it was requested that it be written in Arial font 12. And someone who had written a section wrote it in Arial font 10, and I didn't check it. That was somewhat annoying, um, and we didn't even get assessed for that grant. So check the text size, check the font and word count, and make sure that the document flows if there are multiple authors. You know your business inside out. You understand the language of your business. You use acronyms or shortcuts and conversations with your employees, your peers, your customers. Your grant application could be understood by any and probably all of these three groups. But if you're applying to a specialist, but are you applying to a specialist grant provider or a generalist one? If it's a specialist grant provider who understands your sector and your jargon, that's fine. But if it's a general, if it's a general grant that you're applying to, you must assume that the grant assessor knows nothing about your business. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Assume that they know nothing about your business. So how comprehensible is your proposal to that layperson? Is it steeped in technology terms or using acronyms and abbreviations without explanation? So I think it's always a good idea in that case to get someone else 
preferably outside of your business, to read your proposal and see if they understand what you're applying for in clear and concise terms. So if there are areas that they don't understand, then you may consider that the assessor is also at a loss as to what your proposal is about. So remember, I said earlier, the majority of grant funding schemes are considerably oversubscribed and applications will be assessed ruthlessly. The assessor's job is to get rid of the things which don't have a clear cut response to the grant. If an assessor has to work hard to understand what your proposal is all about, or even worse, if you don't explain something, but put in a link to your website as your response and expect them to get information off your website, then you will be rejected. So make sure that someone outside your business can understand your proposal without it raising any questions. Revise any part of it if they are unsure what it means. Get them then to tell you in their own words what your business does, what the application is for, what the need is for the project, what the impacts are, and how you're going to measure them, and how you're going to match fund the grant. If they who don't know your business, and I know it's a lot to ask of, of somebody, so it probably should be a good friend. Um, if they can read your application, come back and tell you those things, then your assessor will get it. Finally, step 11, submission. Homer's there going, oh, with plenty of time, with five minutes to submit this, it's online, hit a button, away it goes. Back in the day before uh, online applications, in fact, in 2005, uh, we were bidding for a £250,000 grant to deliver a business technology support program, which is quite ironic. Um, and one of the team was writing up the technical aspects of the bid, and he was running a bit late. So it was a Friday afternoon. He left Derry, where we're based, at 2 o'clock to get to Dundonald uh, in uh, East Belfast, uh, just past Dormant, for a closing time of 4 o'clock. And due to heavy traffic on a Friday afternoon, coming over Glen Sheen, heading Belfast uh, at rush hour, he arrived at 10 past 4. So the proposal wasn't even accepted at the reception desk. They said, sorry, we can't take that. We can't stamp it. It wasn't here in time. Uh, so that was the guts of two weeks work down the drain. Now, most applications nowadays are online, but today's equivalent of the heavy traffic would be you have a Wi-Fi crash, your internet has gone down, your website's gone down, your computer is malfunctioning, uh, you're unfamiliar with the uploading process. So always endeavour to give yourself plenty of time and if I'm doing grant or tender applications, I always make sure that I upload it the evening before the closing date, because if something can go wrong, rest assured it will. So finally, we're at step 12, success and failure. So ask questions, always ask questions. And the little cloud there says, failure is a success learned, success is a lesson applied. So there are so many ponderables and variations in grant applications that a good project will not necessarily always get funded. You may have felt that you followed through in every aspect highlighted here and you don't understand why you got rejected. So ask questions, contact the funder, and shout at them, thank them for the opportunity to submit your proposal and ask for feedback from the assessor or the panel to allow you to learn from your application and to be able to refine your next uh, application should there be a next time. Great to get uh, written feedback. If you think that your proposal was unfairly assessed, you can ask, is there an appeals procedure and how you can register an appeal? However, if there are some obvious points of omission in your original proposal, going back through steps one to 10, then take this as a learning project as a learning process to be used in your next application. And really, the more you do it, the better you become and try to improve your success rates from not percent, if it's your first time and you failed, you have a zero success rate of uh, application to 50%, which is achievable at the top end. Um, I wouldn't say that we would have 50%, but we would be certainly at 40%. Learn from both your successes and your failures if you're successful. Keep on doing what you did well, 
and improve what you did not so well. Again, when you, when you are successful, ask a question. What did I score well in? I'm good at that. What did I not score well in? So it's extremely competitive in the, uh, the grant uh, world, as, as probably some of you already know. And like everything competitive to succeed, you need to hone your skills. And remember, it's not a personal thing. The assessor doesn't know you, doesn't know your business. It's, I hate to be glib about it, but it's a game. There are rules. If you play by the rules and you're good at playing by the rules, you will succeed. So that was uh, a 40 minute run through of grant applications. So to end our story, there's always a prologue or an epilogue. There's a lot of work involved in getting a successful grant application over the line. So as I keep saying, funds are limited. So make sure your business is a fit for the grants. Follow good proposal writing techniques and don't be afraid to ask for help you know, from your staff, from your accountant, friends, family advisors. And if you do have a grant application in mind or in progress at the minute, then ABC's mentoring support is available to local businesses applying for grant funding. Uh, we won't write it for you, uh, but we will make sure that you are pushing all the right buttons. So there is an online registration, again, which is very simple. Um, if it comes up here, there is a schedule of webinars, which we're doing with four of them between now and March. But underneath that, again, give us the three priority areas of grant support that you're interested in, which will allow us to shape the, the next presentations. Uh, what grant are you currently in the process of applying for? Tell us what that is. And then, quite simple business information, uh, email address, uh, what type of business are you? What sector do you work in? How can we contact you? Uh, how long have you been established? Tick the boxes. Uh, in under five minutes, you'll have registered your interest on the, on the program. Uh, you can avail of up to seven hours of free support. The places are limited. I will hasten to add, uh, we have about 50 places left on the program between now and May next year. I believe that there are 80 registration, over 80 registrations for this webinar. So if each of you had a grant application in mind or in process and you all applied, then that would be the program finished uh, or completed. But um, if you register your interest, then we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, so we wish you every success, uh, do it, do it again, keep on doing it, keep following the, the, the rules and regulations. And what we'll do is we'll leave you with some useful addresses to follow up on, uh, links to help you identify potential grants. Uh, so we've got the NI Business Info, Intertrade Ireland also run a whole lot of grants, not necessarily funding, uh, although they do have Brexit vouchers, uh, but a lot of of grants for employing people to do cross-border trade. So we will send these out to you uh, at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, also want to do a quick add here. I've mentioned that we run the Transform Your Business program. Again, there's an expression of interest form, very easy to fill in. Uh, it is, um, again, an online application form. And I don't think this takes you to form as it does. So we have six elements of support in the Transform Your Business program. If you're 18 to 29 years old, you can join our Young Entrepreneurs program. If you're looking at becoming an early exporter, you can join our First Steps in Exporting. Your business might be a little bit in the uh, last century in terms of its digital transformation. We can give you digital transformation support and what you need to do to transform your business. If you're a business that's looking for uh, support and moving more into digital technologies, we can do that. Uh, if you're a social enterprise, we can provide you with a lot of support. And if you're a business generally in manufacturing some sort of products or creating new services, then we can provide you with innovation support. We've got over 60 mentors on our books, all professional uh, mentors, experts in their area, and they can provide you with anywhere up to 21 hours of support, or if you're in a social enterprise, 42 hours of support. Uh, so we would be delighted. And again, 
uh, you will be given the um, contact details at the end. So we are recruiting in that program now until uh, November next year. So there's plenty of space on that one. And once you uh, complete the online expression of interest form and your eligibility has been checked by the council, one of our consultants will come out and carry out an initial business assessment to identify what support you need and you'll be able to avail of that professional support. And again, like all the programs which we run for the council, they are free of charge to you. Oh, wow. Thank you for your time today. I see we're just coming up to 11 o'clock. Uh, so I think we're bang on time. So we look forward to working with uh, some of you in the near future. Happy grant hunting. And if there are any questions that you have been putting in to Claire, we'd we'll be delighted to take them. So Claire, back to you. Hi Barney, thanks. Um, some questions have come through. I've answered some questions live on the Q&A facility there, they were specific, um, and some have come through the chat. Um, so one question, in procurement you said that you cannot specify a brand. What if I want to purchase and, and add on to a specific piece of machinery that is unique to that brand? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you can get proof in writing from the supplier, that, that it's only brand specific add-ons can be used with that piece of machinery. Uh, and, or also that if the, the um, manufacturer says that any, uh, any additional uh, one will nullify uh, any warranty or service contract, then you can specify that, that brand. Um, otherwise you can't. But I would always clear it with the uh, the funders first of all. Uh, but we have had that before, and yes, they were able because it was a very specific add-on to a very specific machine. They were able to to purchase it. Great. And then another query is: I'm not VAT registered. Can I claim the VAT as part of a capital grant? Well, the VAT question always comes up. Um, it depends on the terms of the grant. Um, if you are you can claim the VAT, but that's added to your cost. If Dara gave grants, as I said, up to just under five thousand uh, pounds, that was to keep it under a specific level. So if you were VAT registered, you could buy a piece of equipment for ten thousand pounds plus VAT. And we're just doing round figures here with my math, isn't that good? So that'll be twelve thousand pounds. You could claim the five thousand pounds. For the grant and then claim back the two thousand pounds from the batman so that's how you would do that if you were not that registered you would have to pay the the additional two thousand pounds of that on that um so being not that registered means you have an additional cost uh an example another example is invest in nice innovation vouchers where their vouchers are five thousand pounds plus the VAT. You will get the five thousand pounds from in the from Invest NI, but you have to pay the VAT, so it's not reclaimable from uh, Invest NI. So the answer is it depends upon the grant, um, but it's not always claimable uh, from uh, as part of the grant. Um, and you mentioned the grant support mentoring program. So does that mean you will write a business? You will write an application for me for my business? Uh, who's that answer? Um, no, <laughs> the, answer, the answer is no. Um, and again, I made a point earlier on, you know your business. Um, we, we were going in for a very major grant application uh, as part of a consortium uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it was a four, four million pound grant and there were lots of partners and nobody really wanted to take the lead on it. So we hired somebody to write, to write the grant application and I felt it would have been better if each group had written their part of the application because they know exactly their business and had got the consultant to do as I said earlier to make sure there's a flow across the, the document um, that's one aspect to it the other aspect is is quite simply the amount of time available for support for business under the grant under the grant support program is very limited 
this is a pilot program. If it works out well, then council will ex hopefully expand it next year. Um, but uh, as, I, as I think I said in the presentation, there is a maximum availability of seven hours per company. Um, and that's really for an assessor or one of our consultants to go in to make sure they're following the 12 steps, to give them advice and guidance, to point them in the right direction and make sure that they write it from, the, from their heart and with their passion and not me coming in as a job and, and writing it for them. Okay, and then how many businesses can you support on this program? That's, that's um, I forgot to mention that in the application, didn't I? Uh, or in the presentation. There are enough hours in the program to provide 30 businesses with seven hours or 60 businesses with three and a half hours. So it really depends upon the demand and the amount of work involved on each particular business. If it's a, if it's a large grant and takes a lot more time for us to be able to provide that support, then um, it, it's going to use up more hours so there's less businesses on it. So minimum of 30, maximum 60. We've already had 10 businesses through the program. Uh, which leaves, but they weren't all seven hours. So which leaves us about somewhere around 50 at three and a half hours. I know it's not a very straightforward answer, but it's a, it's a, it's a piece of string which, which varies. Um, and as I said, I think there are 84 registered on this webinar. Actually 93 um, in the 93. <laughs> so if they all turn up uh, looking, looking for a grant support, then we, we will, hey, we'll meet our targets before Christmas. Well, you also talked about the subscription service and someone has asked how much does a subscri subscription service cost? Mm. Oh God, Claire, thanks. Um, that's another piece of string question. Um, the answer is it depends upon so many different variables. You take GrantFinder, for instance. GrantFinder is, um, it provides a whole range of services and the more you, the more you get, the more you pay for. So uh, how many people have access to the service from your business? Each one of those has a license. What particular subject areas are targeted? Some are more expensive than others because the grants are much bigger. How much detail do you require in terms of your um, monthly reports? You get that monthly or weekly reports that, that you get. How often do you get your reports? Um, are you an active searcher yourself uh, or are you passive? And if you're passive, then you're asking them to do more work to identify the grants. Um, but to from the research that that we've done, uh, anywhere between a hundred pounds and a thousand pounds a month uh, is is um, a cost. But bear in mind that that you can access uh, grant search engines through the likes of Invest in Eyes Library. Um, so if you're really interested in one particular area go up to the Invest in Eye Library and check it out. Yeah, and there's a few questions coming through and a lot, you know, I know that there's going to be no easy answer to them because um, every, every, every fund or every grant that you go for is on a case by case basis, basically. Um, so in terms of eligibility, you know, you need to check through the eligibility checkers and stuff like that. So um, there's one, um, what are innovation vouchers available for? Innovation vouchers are available to test a, to test develop a, a new product or even a new service. Um, you use innovation voucher. You're, you get a, a five thousand pound innovation voucher um, based upon your application to invest in I. You don't have to be an invest in I client. You don't even have to be a business uh, or a comp sorry a limited company to access innovation vouchers. Uh, what happens is you, you will be given five thousand pounds worth of academic support from a university academic or a further education college academic. And I believe you can also have an academic from across the border. So from an Institute of Technology in, in Dundalk or Letter Ken here Sligo um, to carry out a, a piece of research. And what you're paying, what the invoice innovation budget is paying for there is the services, the knowledge and the equipment that the uh, educational research establishments have. Um, 
Yeah, it's kind of a proof of concept, isn't it? And the, yeah, it's it's, yeah, it's, 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 like an, it's like an introduction into that. There are proof of concept grants which are much bigger. So you can almost use them as like a, a pathway. You get an innovation voucher coming out of that. You could use the outputs of that to apply for a textile proof of concept where you can get up to 35,000 pounds. So, so it's, it's part of a continuum. Yeah, and although you get the 5,000 pound innovation voucher, you, the business is liable to pay the VAT That's right. element yeah. of that 5,000 pound um, to participate yeah. on, on uh, the innovation voucher program. So can if you're if you're not a if you're not a bad racer company, then you have to pay that. If you are, you can claim it back. You claim it back, yeah. So if can you give any examples of how the Invest in innovation grants specifically have been used? So that would be like the R and D grants or the. Uh, um, and again, that's probably how long is a piece of string. How long is a piece of string? I mean, we've had innovation grants used for um, people coming up with new service ideas you know how, how can i it has to be used for something which which is innovative obviously to the to the business sector so they can be used for for service somebody is developing a, a new financial product uh, and how they sell that they've had an innovation voucher for that but it's mainly used for developing a new widget you know a new a new part a new component to make uh, I've, I've seen one where there was a new jet nozzle head designed for a power washer, which provided a much better output from a power washer. Uh, they weren't designed the power washer, you know, they're all over the place, but this was a, was a new attachment to it. So it's basically you, you need to talk to your Invest and I uh, innovation voucher person. We should have put that uh, contact up there. Um, they're the ones who will who will really say yes, that's why uh, eligible or no, it's not. Then you can work with people like ourselves to say, well, okay, how do we do all? How do we respond to all the questions that are asked in the application form to make sure that you know? And they're not as because it's it's early stage proof of concept. You're not really looking far down the business line, but you're looking to see like you're not going to create a perpetual motion machine. For instance, because we know that they, they, they don't work. Yeah, and there's lots of resources available on NI Business Info as well that provide like case studies of businesses who have been through different processes or and have availed of different funds um, across the portfolio of support programs that are available and also grant opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it would be worthwhile, you know, just taking some time um, and, and looking through the NI Business Info um website because it is a it's a fantastic resource i would say it's a it's a fabulous resource actually um and even if you're a, a teacher or working in technology there's all sorts of case studies and and examples of businesses that that can, can be used even if you're not looking for for a grant application um it really is a a, a fabulous and an incredibly wide-ranging website so if ever you're sitting having a cup of coffee and 15 minutes and nothing to do, what I'll do, go on NI Business Info. You'll go down a rabbit hole right now. Sometimes you go on it and you could be on for an hour. Never, so. You never come out. So we have another question then. Um, uh, my business is split in two. This is from Sinead. One is a profit-driven business and the second is a social enterprise. Where can I get advice as both can get grants, but I'm never sure who or how to ask for advice? Well, uh, if you're a social enterprise, um, there's a program called Transform, um, which we we run, and, and there is a specific support program within that for social enterprises, um, which will help you look at your business uh, from all aspects of business and and provide you with whatever support. So please stick in an application. Um, having having a business split into, when you say split into two. Are they both independently registered? I presume they must be because a social enterprise is a company level by guarantee and a business would not be. Uh, so even if you have two businesses, you are eligible as independent businesses to make applications to whatever you want. If you are two businesses uh, looking for two separate grants, you could both apply to the mentoring support grant program here because you're, we, we've 
we focus on the business entities, not necessarily the, the person who owns them. So there's no reason why you, you can't do each one independently uh, and make applications for either grants or for support programs. And certainly on the, I don't know what your, your other business does, uh, but we certainly do have a social enterprise stream and we'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, and then are you marked down if you want to expand but would not be employing people? Again, that, that depends on the grant and the fund. It, it depends on the, on the grant. It's always nice to see um, employment growth, but and I, I really shouldn't say this, and Claire, stop me if I'm going to say something wrong here, but we believe that uh, wealth generation is important rather than job creation for a business. If you create jobs without having sustainability behind it, then you're pl placing your business at risk. If you can create sustainability, and sometimes I call that wealth, uh, by selling more and doing things more efficiently and effectively, you're safeguarding the jobs that you have because you're, you're creating more um, GDP per head if you want to call it that way, um, and put you in a position where further down the line, you will create jobs as you're, you can't continue to expand your business and not create jobs. But it, it shouldn't be that you have to create jobs or a grant, but it's a nice outcome if you can. And quite often we see further, further down the line, people will say, uh, we will increase our revenues by 20% this year and uh, increase our efficiencies by 15%. But next year, we'll further increase our revenues by 25%, and then that will lead to increased employment. It has to, you know, if you're going to keep growing. Okay, so final question. Um, it's a, a long one. So I am an educator who has not been able to avail of any government funding over COVID. I've been trying to move my in-person work to online and wondered if you could advise where to start looking for funding. I help resource teachers and parents to grow happy little humans from the inside out by providing digital masterclasses, courses, and a membership where I provide monthly lessons and support. Um, the first thing I would say, I'm not going to answer that uh, online here, but if you are based in the ABC, uh, I would say that the Digitech Enterprise Program that we run will give you uh, time with a consultant to really look at your business and your business model, get in depth into it, and see you know what what is the best way to go, because you're in essence becoming a digital business if you're providing all your support online. We have, uh, as I said, we have that program. I think it provides seventeen and a half hours, Claire, of support. Uh, under Digitech Enterprise to look at, at the business aspect of a business which wants, which is or is becoming uh, digital. So r rather than try to give you a, a off the top of my head answer on where you get funding now, please um, go to that last slide uh, and sign up and express of interest form. And we will definitely get you onto that program and work with you in depth to to try to resolve that. Grants aren't always the necessarily the answer. Um, there may be other solutions, but there also may be grants out there. A lot of the grants that we talk about are invest in I type support. There are a lot of educational philanthropic organizations out there who may tie in with digital philanthropic organizations and want to see how do we increase that. So there's a whole different area uh, that, that we can look at. But please register for the Transform program uh, under the Digi Digitech Enterprise stream. Yeah, so we're running out of time, or we've run out of time. Um, I think we've got through um, most of the questions. Any that we haven't answered, we will um, send them on in a follow-up um, from today. And we'll also send through a copy of the, the recording of this webinar will be made available through our Mad and Bridge and Craig Avon Council's website. And we'll also send through a copy of the slides um, for reference. Um, so that just leaves us now to thank everyone for joining us um, this morning. Um, we hope that it was beneficial. We hope to see um, applications coming in um, for the business support programs um, 
through the council and also if there's any grant applications that you're thinking about applying for um, then please do keep in mind that this mentoring support package is available to you from our MAB and Bridging Creek Avon Council. So thank you all for your time this morning um, and that just leaves us to wish you um, a lovely rest of your Tuesday um, and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. bye.